decoration. And you brought flowers and you put on everybody's grave and you had a big dinner on the ground and then you went in the church and they'd have singing and stuff like that. But it turned into, over the years, Memorial Day. Now, the Bible talks a lot about that. And uh, the Bible talks about uh, war. As a matter of fact, if you took out all the references to war and fighting and armies and battles in the Bible... Old and new, your Bible will be way thinner than it is. I mean, it's just fight, 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 fight. And the whole history of the Bible is basically, in one sentence, who's going to run who? That's the way it's always been. Who's going to Who's going to be the kingdom? Who's going to run the world? Who's, and it's still that way today. The, Bible, the Koran's not a book like that. Other religious books are not like that. But the Bible is the Word of God, so it's like that. Now, what I want to do this morning is I'm going to talk about stones, uh, memorial stones, and what they mean. There's three different types and places in the Bible that I, I want to talk about this morning. The first one would be in Arlington Cemetery near Washington, D.C. Most of you have heard of Arlington Cemetery, our National Cemetery. It was began... Um, uh, over 150 years ago, and uh, it's considered by many the most hallowed ground in America. There's these white stones. They come up with a, with a uh, design for them, and they're white marble stones about that wide and about that high. I know you've seen pictures of them, and they're just lines and lines and lines. You might not know this, but there's 400,000 of them things. Can you imagine how big of a graveyard it would take for 400,000 soldiers who were buried there in Arlington National Cemetery? My, 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 my. Think about that. In World War I, we lost 116,000 men or, or women. In World War II, 405,000. That's almost a half a million in World War II. Korea, we lost 54,000. Vietnam, 58,000. And they just keep mountain and mountain. That's not even to mention more, more than all of them in, uh, in the Civil War, uh, the North and the Confederate and Union soldiers. I want to talk about men like that who gave their life. Many of those guys went into a battle and, and some of them wars, they didn't fight on computers and punching buttons and blowing up stuff like they do now. It was hand-to-hand -hand combat. And many of those young boys went like this, and they said, here comes the troops, y'all. And they'd have a bayonet and a rifle, and be like, it'd be like, uh, let's all, a couple of hundred of us get on this side, and maybe a couple of hundred on that side, and just charge each other. That's, that was their battle. And, buddy, a lot of those boys, their commander would say, all right, fire! And buddy, them boys would run in the back of their mind. They were saying, I'm probably never going home. God take care of my wife. God take care of my babies. And went charging right in there and said, I'm going to give my life for my country. And the COVID. and God blew up. I mean, we're talking over 400,000 of them, people. 400,000. And they're stones today. Our kids need to know that. When I say, Daddy, what meaneth these stones? It meant that our, 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 some of them, our forefathers, and that was for our fathers. I heard of a story um, in Korea in 1951. A sergeant um, actually wrote a letter to a fellow soldier of his who, who was, uh, gave his life on the battlefield in Korea. And he said this, something like this, I'll abbreviate. He said, Dear Sergeant, you were standing in directly in front of me when those rounds were fired and you died, gave your life. Um, he said that was on June the 8th, 1951. He said, they took you out. And he said, I got to come home. You didn't get to come home with us. You died there on the battlefield in, in the Korean War. And he said, I came home. He said, all these years, I searched for your family to tell them I appreciated that you stood in front of me and gave your life like that. I finally found them in North Dakota. I found your daughter, Kathy. I talked to her. You never got to know your daughter, Kathy. 
You gave your life there. But he said, they're fine family. And I just want you to know that I appreciate it. I will never forget what you've done for me. That's a memorial. That's a memorial. You know, when you hear about 400 people, 1,000 people dying, you just think like a number, a statistic. But every one of them had a kid, had a wife. Had a, I mean, it's a family just like mine and yours. It meant something. Over in the Navy, uh, uh, in, uh, there was a young man from Nebraska named John Parl. And John Parle, uh, after Pearl Harbor, was, um, was uh, in the Mediterranean in 1943, over in Italy, Sicily, Italy. And these, this young man, only 23 years old, his boy was in the army, and they were planning a big attack the next day, and we had a bunch of ships out here in the water. And that night, him and his friends noticed that a small boat had a fire on it. And that boat was full of explosives and weapons and stuff that if it had caught on fire would have just ruined the whole planned out invasion and also alerted the enemy and they would have probably come and attacked and killed our soldiers. We were planning a surprise attack and all those ships were out there and that little boat caught on fire. Listen to me. That young man, only 23 years old, ran down there, didn't have to, didn't have a special order, but he willingly ran down that hill, or, or that ship, uh, the side of that ship, off down the ladder, got into that little boat, and the smoke was everywhere, and grabbed that burning piece of equipment with his hands. It burned his hands nearly all. He grabbed it and threw it into the ocean and the Mediterranean Sea and saved our boys and the, the battle went good and we won that battle. But that 23-year-old boy died from burns and smoke inhalation. There's you an American hero right there. There's you a hero. I mean, there's a boy who's only 23 and said, look, if it means my life or is it going to let, the, let them take over and kill a bunch of us, I'll give my life. They gave it for our fathers. They gave it for our fathers, y'all. What a blessing. We need to teach our children to respect and honor that flag. I get to stand up here and preach the Bible this morning. Whatever the Lord lays on my heart because we live in a country where we're free to do this. Don't take that for granted. Somebody died our fathers for our fathers. Somebody died for our fathers. What means them stones? It means me and you have the freedom to stand and preach and pray and live right. This this uh, thing we heard, I heard Mike mention it in Sunday school, and I can't help but uh, I think Carrie sent me a text the other day, a little picture. You know, they send these pictures with quotes on it. And uh, all of us were shocked this week because of that bombing, that suicide bomber in Manchester, England, over there above London. And all these kids were in this concert over 20,000 people, that little brat girl up there performing, and uh, she's up there singing and performing, and all of a sudden a bomb went off and blew up 20 people, or 20, ever how many it was, about 60 got wounded, and people went out of there like crazy, and they got scared, and Carrie sent me this little picture on my phone. You know what Ariana Grande said? You kids listen to me. You kids listen to me. Ariana Grande said, I hate America and I hate Americans. That poor little girl is a victim of liberal, left-wing, democratic media brainwashing. She makes her living off of this country. She's allowed to express her opinion because of this country. And when, when that happened over there, she got all tore up and shocked and said, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Maybe God might wake her up just a little bit. You know, she's standing in front of millions of fans and says, I hate America, I hate Americans. Lord have mercy, people. That's the day we're living in. We ought to appreciate our fathers and those stones represent our fathers that gave the life so me and you could live in this country. Secondly, I'm going to show you another set of stones. Take your Bible, turn to Acts chapter number 7, please. And this is by a man by the name of Stephen. Acts chapter number 7, we see a get stones again. And this man was a preacher. And this preacher, this young preacher by the name of Stephen, he was a 
uh, one of the first deacons there, and he preached a burning hot message. And the Bible said he called them stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart. He did not get up and say, isn't it wonderful to be here? God loves us all and you're precious to him. Nope, he said, you bunch of stiff-necked, uncircumcised in heart, you always resist the Holy Ghost just like your fathers do. And it said they were cut to the heart and they stopped in verse 57 and ran upon him with a Honda. And verse number 58 said, uh, they come out of the city. No, that one accord means they, uh, they, were, they was in a uh, civic. No, actually, it means they all got together. And it said here in verse number 58, they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he said this, he fell asleep. Right there begins a generation of what we call Christian martyrs. A martyr, listen, a martyr is somebody who seals their testimony with their own blood. A martyr is somebody who willingly offers themselves for the cause of Christ. So that first bunch I mentioned died for the fathers. The second bunch I'm going to talk about died for our faith, died for our faith. Paul, the apostle, goes into this category where they, they killed him there. As he said, I'm now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. John the Baptist preached only six months. Boy, he would be a considered a flop today. No Sunday school, no buses, no buildings, no air condition, no crusades, no nothing. John the Baptist preached six months and they put him in jail for preaching and they went down there and said, you know why they put him in jail for preaching? He preached against their sin. He said, you bunch of wicked people, you bunch of snakes, you bunch of vipers. Listen, brother, that's, that's what's wrong with this country tonight today. We ain't got a bunch of preachers like that right there. He went up there and he told King Herod, it ain't lawful for you to have your brother's wife. She's married to another man. You leave her alone. You get away from her. And, buddy, they wound up in jail. And John was sitting down there in jail. He didn't say, Lord, you've done me wrong. You've done me up. But he did have a little bit of doubt. And one day they come down there and they said, uh, we're going to cut your head off today, preacher. How you like that, Baptist preacher? And uh, we're going to cut your head off. And they went after that Methodist head. They went after that Presbyterian head, that Baptist head. That's the one they wanted because he preached against dancing. Them other ones don't preach against dancing. And uh, they said, we're going to take your head off, big boy. And they said, what do you think about that? And John got a little bit nervous and a little bit scared. And he said, uh, will you go over and ask him, is, is he, I've got this right, ain't I? I, I, I got this, I want to make sure now. I've got this right. And will you go ask him, is he really God's son? And his disciples went over and they said, Jesus, Jesus, they're getting ready to cut John's head off. He said, I know it. Ain't you going to go over and deliver him? Nope. Uh, this way it's got to be right now. Sometimes it just has to be that way. I don't always do everything the way people think I should. I, I'll, I'll take care of him, though. And they said, well, he wants to know if you're really him. And he said, well, you tell him that the blind see, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and uh, it's everything going on schedule. And they said, yes, sir. And he said, oh, yeah, tell him, blessed is he if he's not offended in me. And they went over here and they said, John, we talked to him. He said, the dead are raised, blind people seeing, the kingdom of God's coming, and don't be offended, son. You've done your job. You've run your race. And John said, all right, take me. And they took that old preacher out there, and they put his head down down on the chopping block, and he said, now you make sure you get it good. I ain't want to go to a hospital. I want to go to heaven. And they, and they said, uh, get it about right there, guys. And uh, they took that big old thing like that, literally, and go, wham! and off goes his head. I don't know where we got this idea in America that a preacher is supposed to be a celebrity and own, and you know, and, and drive a $100,000 car and own a jet and everything else. I mean, there's nothing wrong with God blesses somebody. But I'm telling you, John the Baptist, he went to glory. He was in the presence of the Lord shouting before his toes quit wiggling. He gave his life. And to, you say, well, he wasn't a success. Listen, them stones was a reminder for us today that they died for our faith they died for our faith so me and you can stand in this choir so me and you can give out tracks so we can run our buses up and down the, the country thank God them guys died for our faith 
You know, we need to toughen up just a little bit. Somebody says something about us at work and we're ready to change churches and go to the big shop church that don't get persecuted if you go there. Uh, somebody says just a little bitty thing against us and we're ready to whine out. Poor little us. We're so pitiful. I was down there preaching this week and old Chris and them, they run three bands. And they run three bands. They brought about 50 kids every night on them bands to church. Some of y'all seen all those kids they was bringing. And he got an old boy down there and that boy come to him on Wednesday night he was sick all day, had a, had a, had a uh, uh, tooth swelled out like that right there. Uh, I, was, I was buying my wife a Bluetooth speaker, so she'd been listening to preaching all the time. And I told that woman, I said, Bluetooth, I don't even know what that is. I don't even know how to work it, what it is. I always thought that meant you better go to the dentist and get it took out. Uh, and uh, and she laughed. She thought that was the funniest thing. And uh, and you know what? Uh, 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 that old boy, he had a tooth bothering him. His face was swelled out Tuesday night. And the preacher said, uh, Brian, are you going to be able to come? He said, yes. He said, well, I'll drive your van for you. And that old boy looked at him and he said, no, sir, you're not either. He said, that's my job. God gave me that van. God gave me them kids. I'll be driving that. And that boy drove that van Tuesday night, Wednesday night, and Thursday night with his jaw swelled up with a tooth out. You know why? He said, I'm a soldier in God's army and I'm going to do my job that God gave me to do. There ain't best getting your head cut off. Least little old thing. We're ready to quit church. Least little old thing. We don't even go to church unless it's fun. I'm telling you, brother, a soldier don't always have fun. They gave their life for our faith. William Tyndale the great Bible uh, 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 preacher who made sure the Bible was in English. Our King James Bible is basically William Tyndale's Bible that he translated. We have the King James Bible because of William Tyndale, humanly speaking. And that boy, they took him and tied him up and set him on fire and burned him to death. I believe I can stand it if it's a little rainy. I believe I can go ahead and read my Bible if 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 everybody else is out having a picnic. I believe that we ought to be able to do a little better. Lord have mercy, they died for our faith. John Huss in Bohemia in 1374. He preached against the indulgences of the Catholic Church. You see, the Catholic Church basically run the world. That's why they call it the Dark Ages. Worst time the world's seen, and, and stuff like that, when the Catholic Church run the world. And these guys, these Protestant reformers, they called them, preached against the indulgences. They preached against the Mass. They preached against uh, the worship of Mary. They preached against the, uh, uh, the Pope being infallible. They preached against that. Nowadays, all you, they got books in the Christian bookstore now down here, uh, down the road here, that are saying, well, there's, there's wonderful things about the indulgences and the Mass can be wonderfully celebrated and it's just a different denomination. No, sir. Them old preachers said, it's heresy. The Pope's not infallible. He's not the rock that the church is built on. The Catholic Church was a whore of Revelation 17. That's what them old time preachers preach. I don't think God changed his mind neither. Read about that city on, set on seven hills, Rome, in Revelation 17, whose cut of golden cut, purple and scarlet with her colors, and mother of harlots and abominations of this earth. Ladies and gentlemen, William Tyndale, John Huss, John Wycliffe, they preached against it. They preached against it. And they preached against it. And you know what John Huss said? They had his trial in 1415. They said, you're a heretic. They tied him up with a stake like that. They set it on fire to burn him to death. And you know what he said? He said, I will die today with gladness. I'm going home. Praise God. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, you know what them stones meant in that Bible? Our fathers died for our faith that you and I believe in. You know, they say a bond is created by people in war like no other. 
people who served in the military. That's why these soldiers, they'll be having gatherings all over the place tomorrow. They like to go back, well, hey, how you doing? How your family? You create a bond when you're in there serving with people. Like, you know, your high school, you have a little bond. College, whatever, you have a little bond. And that's the way it is in church. When we fight the battles together, and we see God answer our prayers together, and we see souls get saved to the youth rally, that'll bind us together like no other. We're soldiers in an army, y'all. We're fighting, we're fighting. Onward says our commander, let's go, let's go. Get the job done. I want to say that first stones represent our fathers. That second set of stones represents our faith. Finally, let me show you one more. Take your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter number uh, 28. Look at Matthew 28, and let's look at another stone here in the Bible and what it represents. It's a stone that was at the tomb of the Lord Jesus Christ. What meaneth this stone? You know what meant them first stones in Arlington? The faith of, of our, 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 I mean, our soldiers, our fathers. You know what meant them second stones piled up on Stephen's grave? Our faith. But look at this one. Matthew chapter 28 and verse number 2. It said this, And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and set up on it. His countenance was like lightning, his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became his dead men. And the angel answered and said, Fear not, I know you seek Jesus crucified. He is not here. Glory to God. Hallelujah. If you were walking along there one time, and if you knew where this was, I don't know if anybody does, they say, What meaneth this stone? What meaneth this stone? In Arlington Cemetery, it represents our fathers. The pile of stones they killed Stephen with represents martyrs dying for our faith. But if you went to the garden tomb and you saw this big old stone, they say it's eight feet around. It's 4,000 pounds. It'd be like trying to move one of them cars with no wheels on it. Them disciples couldn't do it. And you say, what meaneth this stone? They say that stone was moved so that you could look in there and see he is not here. He is risen. And you know what that represents? Our future. Them first stones represents our, our fathers. That second pile of stones represents our faith. But thank God that third stone, what meaneth that stone? That means Jesus got up out of that grave over victorious over death, hell, and the grave, shaking the keys, brother, in the devil's face, and said, Hallelujah, because I live, you shall live also. That's mine in your future. I'm glad. What means that stone? It means me and you got a future. If he got up, you're going to get up. If he got up, Mama and Daddy's going to get up. Papa's going to get up. John Wesley's going to get up. John we uh, Whitfield, Whitfield and all them guys. George Whitfield, uh, Charles Spurgeon, D.L. Moody. All them bodies are going to come out of that grave one of these days. Amen. You know what that, you know what that stone means? That stone means he who said he was God, because he lives, we shall live also. It means victory over sin. It means comfort in sorrow. It means promise of the future. It means help in need. It means a friend that sticks closer than a brother. That means right now we can come up here and get down here and talk to him because that stone was moved away from that, uh, that tomb and he ain't in there no more. Hallelujah. Thank God for that memorial stone. You say, preacher, what meaneth this stone? It means harlots and drunks can be forgiven. It means drug addicts can come and start a brand new life right here today. That stone being rolled away and Jesus, he didn't have to die, you know. He didn't have to die. Now, a lot of them guys in the army, and I'm not, I'm not taking anything away from their sacrifice, a lot of them didn't really want to. And they, didn't, and they tried to get out of it and then got killed anyway. Jesus could have got out of it and didn't. Bible said he could have called 10,000 angels. I don't know if any of the martyrs would have done that or not. If you was on this cross and you could say, come on, help me, and 10,000 angels come and destroyed all your enemies, that would have been hard not to, wouldn't it? Do you know why Jesus stayed on that cross? Do you know why he let blood drip down his hands and his feet? He looked out on that cross that day across Europe and the Mediterranean. He looked across the Atlantic Ocean into a little old place called Morganton, North Carolina. 
the last fell of May in 2017 and saw that little boy and that little girl and all these kids in here and he turned up his cup and drank it and paid the price for me and you. What meaneth that stone? It means victory over sin. It means we get to go to heaven when we leave this world. So when your kids say, Daddy, what meaneth those stone? Son, that means them people died. Our fathers died so we could live in America. Daddy, what meaneth these stones, these big piles? Son, that means people gave their life so me and you could have a Bible and go to church every Sunday. Right? Daddy, what meaneth that stone? Son, they rolled that stone out of the way. They didn't roll that out of the way so he could get out. He done got up and had breakfast before that angel ever got down there that day. They rolled it away so the disciples and Mary could get in. What meaneth these stones? I'm glad somebody paid the price. I'm glad, thank God, he paid it for me. Let's stand by our head for prayer. Every head bowed. Every eye